in this day and age, we have almost endless opportunity with a computer and a phone. So if you don't like what you're doing, pivot, go do something else. I'm not going to pay you to make my clips for my podcast if you have 20 followers on social media and you're telling me that you're a short form editor. How does it actually feel in your day being an entrepreneur? And like a lot of it is, is like struggle. Um, and a lot of it is very challenging. It's really just you versus you for most of the day. You have on your Twitter bio that you generated over 300 million in D to C. Let's kind of dive into that. Where did that 300 million come from? Welcome to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 19. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today's guest is Jess Chan, a marketing and e-commerce powerhouse. She's the founder of Longplay Brands, a retention marketing company, and the mastermind behind Backbone, an email strategy automation tool for D2C e-commerce brands. Jess has generated over 300 million for her D2C clients. Get ready to be inspired as we explore the world of marketing and entrepreneurship with Jess Chan. Let's dive in. Hey, Jess, thanks for coming on the show today. How you doing? Thanks for having me. I am so excited. Yeah, really excited to talk to you. For some reason, you've just been popping up on my timeline a lot lately. So that must mean <laughs> that you're doing something right. But I'm really excited to have you on the show. I'm excited for people to get to know a little bit about you, your background, some of your successes, and even some of maybe your failures. I always like to just get right into it. Who is Jess Chan? How have you evolved over the last 10 years as an entrepreneur? Let's hear all about it. Oh, man, we're coming in hot. Okay, so um, I guess high level, I am the founder and CEO of Longplay and Backbone. So Longplay is a full service retention marketing agency for direct to consumer e-com brands. We've been around for four-ish years now, and we have a team of about 25 to 30-ish, fully remote. And Backbone is our new email strategy automation tool, so essentially a SaaS company, also targeting D2C e-com brands to automate the job of an email marketer. And we just launched that out of our beta like roughly two weeks ago. So definitely from an entrepreneur journey standpoint, very new, um, diving into the tech space, but also I have a few years under my belt just in building businesses. And prior to all of that, I was the CMO of uh, Best Self Co, which was a DSC e-com brand. So that's really kind of where most of my, um, I guess, entrepreneur experience lives and starts. Awesome. So all of it very marketing oriented. Did you go to college for marketing? Was marketing something you were always passionate, excited about? Or did you naturally just kind of fall into that path? I could not have gone to university for a more different degree. So I actually <laughs> went to university or college for actuarial science and economics. And then I also did a minor in political science. So it was like a very nerdy, nerdy mathematical number-based degree. I did four years of multivariate theoretical calculus where we did see a single number, wow. um, lots of essay writing. So just very theoretical, like pure math type stuff. And actuarial science is actually very like statistics heavy, like risk modeling and the, the dream for an actuary is to end up in like a corporation, typically insurance where you're pricing out like life insurance or like car insurance, things like that, which I mean, two, three years in, I was like, eh, I don't really see this as my ideal life path. And I actually went down probably a period of like year and a half ish of like panic attacks, depression, suicidal thoughts, all the things. And kind of in that darker period, I remember just at some point I was like, you know what? I'm over this. Like this is not working for me and we're going to have to find our way out. And that was actually kind of when I started diving into like self-development, the Tim Ferriss, like Seth Godin, just around this concept of like, how do you design your perfect life, sorry, designing my perfect day, all of that. And all of that actually led me to find uh, Best Self, which they sold um, essentially productivity journals and productivity tools for entrepreneurs. So I remember seeing an ad for their self journal when I was like at a hackathon and as a college student, I was like, I can't pay $30 for a journal. That's just like so much money. So I downloaded their free PDF and joined their email list. And two weeks later, I think they had a job posting for a marketing assistant. So I applied for that. And I remember th feeling like this feeling of like, there's nothing more I want in this world than this. Like I've never wanted something more. And at that point, I had zero marketing experience, barely knew what e-com was. It just felt right. So applied for the job, got this marketing assistant job, was working there part-time in my last year of college, and then also part-time at another company as well. And when I graduated, 
graduated, they uh, promoted me to chief marketing officer. And I remember thinking this is the world's most unqualified promotion, but we're just going to run with <laughs> it. And then was there for three and a half years. And it was freaking amazing. So much fun, amazing team, and also just the perfect time in e-commerce and also the business stage where it was a very early stage that just launched a Kickstarter, very early traction, but it was still that like really fun period of like, you have traction, things are working, but it's also so gritty and you can just try everything. Yep. So it's great for just kind of getting my hands dirty in the industry. And from there, I started Long Play. Awesome. And this, what an amazing like journey, so much to unpack. And I think I want to start like all the way at the beginning. I like to kind of learn a little bit more about the guests. Like we always get to see the fun version of you online, successful version of you online. Let's talk about the darker part of it. Like where did that all come from? Why was it rough? Did it have to do with you just not being motivated about that major? And then let's highlight the amazing growth, like the person you were then to the person you are now. Yeah, that's a good question. So the dark period, it was, I just remember thinking like at that time, like mental health wasn't really, like people didn't really talk about it yet. So I just, thought I was going crazy honestly but I remember like just I would wake up with these like insane panic attacks I don't even I've been calling them panic attacks but I honestly don't really know what they are and I just felt like I was going crazy like everything just is like dark and hopeless and like everything just there's like really no light and I remember like just the world and like life just looks differently so for example simple things like hey I have this amazing group of friends and I had a lot of people who loved me but when you're kind of in that mental state you it feels super isolating it's like you're having this panic attack and you're like I can't reach out to anyone like no I'm actually a burden on everyone I'm going to inconvenience everyone so it's this is interesting like I've been calling it kind of like this experience of having like VR goggles on that you can't take off and all of rea reality looks really different and that's something I, I've been not struggling with but just like a recurring theme in like different periods of my life where like that was kind of the start of it and it would come back every once in a while and these days you know it still comes back but like I handle it a lot better it's more of something I know that kind of passes through versus this the first time is really terrifying because you're like like, oh my god is this just gonna be my life forever and like i don't know what to do about this so i think looking back it was really this feeling of like stuckness of not quite just knowing that like the path i'm on is the what i want but i also don't really know what's next or what i do want and i think that's why self-development and just this idea of like designing your own life and being able to switch career paths and like you can create anything you want you can develop any skill set you want you can start a business you can switch your lifestyle all of it is up for grabs i think that was a really empowering like way out of that particular headspace that's awesome and some people might be listening and thinking like why would you bring something like that up like why would you want to dive deep into that and i do it because i think a lot of people go through these struggles and i just think that like you said it used to not be so openly spoken about but thankfully now it is so I think it's important for people listening who maybe aren't feeling great about themselves or are struggling to hear somebody like yourself just explain like, hey, I was there too. like, And I was able to grow out and start these amazing companies and have this amazing journey. Like, I think that's really helpful to people. So I always try and highlight that when anybody says that they went through a little bit of a dark time. I think it's important to talk about it because there might be others who are thinking the same thing that might be listening. And what you just said might be the reason that they wake up tomorrow and go to the gym or wake up tomorrow and get on Twitter and try and make more friends online and build something they're passionate about or transfer to a new job or new major that they're excited. So that's one of the reasons why I always like to highlight something like that, because I think it's really important that people because you think you just made an amazing point. It's like you can really decide to do whatever you want. Like in this day and age, we have almost endless opportunity with a computer and a phone. So if you don't like what you're doing, pivot, go do something else. And I know it's tough. I know it's scary, but that might be the reason you're in that rut or the reason that you're feeling down. Go make a change in your life. And you never know, that might be what brings you like joy or what gets you past that point in your life. So one, thank you for being willing to share it. And two, I hope this, even if it affects one person listening, I think that'll be a success. How did we go from um, super mathematical to marketing. <laughs> we didn't really dive too deep into that. I know that it was the gig that like, did you feel when you took that marketing role that you had wasted your time doing all that math stuff? Or was it just like, I got my degree, let's move on. And this is the path I'm taking. Yeah, it's funny looking back, it, it's funny how um, certain dots connect looking back. And like, at that time, I felt like I was just kind of like flailing and doing a bunch of things that didn't make any sense. But the way I kind of got out of it also, I agree with everything you said fully. And that's kind of also why I started this diary of an entrepreneur series on Twitter is like people need to talk more about the emotional and psychological experience of being an entrepreneur and 
the numbers, your revenue growth, like your team size, like that's all on paper stuff. But like, how does it actually feel in your day being an entrepreneur? And like a lot of it is, is like struggle. Um, and a lot of it is very challenging. It's really just you versus you for most of the day. And I think that's that's really what people should, should talk about more. And I love that we're having this type of conversation. And yeah, I was thinking back on kind of how I got out of that rut. And honestly, the first part of it was really just starting with just doing things. Um, with no particular plan. I'm like, I don't know what I want to do next, but what I can do is like, I can make a plan for tomorrow where I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. and read for an hour. And I'm just going to, I'm like, that's a commitment. And I'm just going to keep grabbing books to like, just keep reading. And there's no particular plan, but I can commit to that. And I can commit to, I used to go on like three, like an hour and a half to three hour long runs, to just listen to like random Tim Ferriss podcasts. And all of this stuff was like, I am depressed. I have no idea what I'm doing next. A little bit suicidal sometimes, but also I can commit to doing these things just don't think just do that was kind of the opening of like okay when, when you're listening to podcasts reading books like ideas start happening and you start seeing pathways and i think that's one of the biggest not mistakes but like areas that people get stuck on is like you people try to determine what their path is going to be and the outcome of it in order to get started and really the trick is like just get started don't be afraid of wasting time and the solution will find itself so i actually started in, in kind of that process i started doing like i was like tinkering around with ui ux designs so i was like i would just like start random challenges for myself where i'm like i'm gonna design a logo go i'm gonna rebrand this website like i'm gonna write a blog article it's like what is this for nothing am i gonna make money off of this definitely not but let's just create random challenges for myself and like essentially being your own boss so like being your own mentor like, i'm just gonna create things for me to do i played around with like development i remember i landed a job as a javascript developer having no no javascript and i was like i got the contract my at some point my parents were like you you can't take this job you don't know javascript so, like but they but they think i do i landed this job but that was good that was good parental advice of like you, you don't even have enough to like start your first day and in that whole process i was like blogging every day and just writing and in that when i started applying for marketing assistant jobs it was mainly this best self one and another one i would just do i said i applied with a five page report on like what i would do if i was their marketing manager i love and, that and in that this is like the world's greatest like hack of like if you want to get a job just apply and do the job before you get paid i'm like what would i do if i was marketing manager and in that that forced me to google like what is marketing manager do oh there's content marketing oh there's seo oh there's like email marketing how would i build this plan and if i were to do content marketing like what five blog topics would i write on and like what influencers would you know make sense for this particular brand and it's funny i looked back on it like probably a year ago and i was like you know what as now as a ceo of a marketing agency i would 100 percent hire this person because no one submits things like this so it's both like a learning process you also find out very quickly whether you really enjoy that particular role like for example i did some for like b2b marketing and i was like eh, like in this process i don't really like this as much you know so that's kind of how i landed that first marketing assistant job and then it was kind of just continuing that that mindset from there yeah there's two things i want to highlight there one and i've said this on other podcasts i love that you took the extra initiative when going to get the job and you just did it before you actually got it and told them what you were going to do i think so many people everybody nowadays thinks oh you need to pay me for this you need to pay me for that and it's like i'm not going to pay you to make my clips for my podcast if you have 20 followers on social media and you're telling me that you're a short form editor, which I'm using that because I'm sure that's in everybody's DMs lately. <laughs> I think that's the new cool thing. And it's like, okay, great. Like, do you want to do this for me? Make me 10 clips for free. Show me that they're good and I'll post them. And if they do well, then I'll hire you. But it's so many people think like, oh, like, no, you need to pay me. You need to pay me. And it's a little bit not the same as what you did, but somewhat the same. It's like, hey, I want this job. Here's a detailed report on how I would do that job. And here's my resume as well. Well, if you like what I wrote that I'm going to do, it's like, okay, I'm going to hire this person. They already know what they're going to do with the job. It's not going to be a six to eight month ramp up period here where we're going to have to teach this person. What is this? What is that? So I love that. I think that's super important. And then another thing I want to highlight is just do something like just take that first step. And I suffer from this so much. Like I'm like, I'm like, oh, I want to get back in the gym. It's like, all right, I got to wait for the first because I, I want to start at the beginning of the month. Like, no, just go to the gym the next day. Like, just get started. So many people read these self-help books, read these entrepreneurial books, take notes, talk about it, but they don't actually do anything about it. Like they don't actually start and get going. And I think that's the key to so many things. Just lean in, put your foot forward, start. And so many things will start to happen that you couldn't even imagine. So two just amazing points from your end there. Let's talk about CMO. That's a 
big position. You're a C-level executive. Like you said, most unqualified job promotion ever. How did you do in that role? What were some of the challenges? What were the, some of the things you learned? Like, let's talk highlights. Yeah, we had, it was so much fun. It's funny. I, now, like owning my own company, I'm like, oh, I miss those days um, when you take out the anxiety of like, will I fail? It's like, oh man, that was like, <laughs> three years of just like let's just test everything you know and i mean i think i did pretty well um i definitely think they were like looking back i'm like there was a lot of opportunities that we missed and like i could have done better in and all of that type of stuff knowing what i know now but at that time it was like i think i was 20 like 20 or 21 when that's amazing we started we grew into like just under a 10 million dollar ar agency or not agency e-com company i remember some of the highlights we launched a kickstarter for an adjustable hourglass and we were fully funded in the first like i don't even know like a few hours and that was really cool like we filmed the whole video launched the kickstarter like that was just a really good experience just a fun experience to get under my belt and to be fully funded very quickly and we raised i think just under 100 grand um within like That's the awesome. first, first like 48 hours or something like that we had like a really awesome facebook group that we did a lot of content marketing and that was like we really figured out like ugc community marketing at that time and i think also selling their like the products that we were selling, they were all, there's no moat around it, right? So for example, if you're selling supplements or like a product like that, like people cannot really make it at home. You might have competition, but you're really selling like the product itself and there's very clear direct benefits. Whereas we were selling like journals and we were we were actually giving out the templates for free. So really like there was no reason anyone really had to buy anything from us. They could always just take screenshots and like duplicate it out in their journal, like their notepad or anything like that. And that really, that, I think that's just like one of the hardest marketing things to get your feet wet in very, very early on where it's like you are fully marketing off of brand or fully marketing off of community and relationship building, you have no product to lean on. Not that the product isn't amazing, but everyone can duplicate their product. There's no reason they have to buy from you. So that was really fantastic just as a first experience looking back. And we, what else did we do? We did like a live event at some point. We hosted it at a WeWork space, had like a hundred people, brought in speakers. We launched, I don't even know how many products. And we did it all with a relatively small team. Like we stayed at, we stayed at a team of like 15 people. I don't think we ever crossed 20 people. But I'd say like the Kickstarter, the live event, events and all that were probably like some of the most fun parts that I'm excited that we got to do at that time. That's awesome. And I mean, I'm sure there was so many invaluable things that you were able to take from that into your companies that are all around marketing. Now you're the CEO of both of them. You have on your Twitter bio that you generated over 300 million in D to C. Let's kind of dive into that. Where did that 300 million come from? What has the experience being the CEO of these companies been? And then we'll kind of dig a little bit deeper because I always like to highlight what the experience looks like from a customer because you never know who's listening. Yeah, for sure. So long play kind of started honestly quite organically. I was still the CMO at Best Self. I, did, I loved it there. I didn't really have any desire to leave at that time. And I was really just going to events. People were like, hey, like, well, how are you doing email marketing for Best Self? Like, could you consult? So I just kind of started saying yes to things. It's kind of in alignment of what we said earlier. It's like, just start saying yes and like yep. it all figure itself out. So I said yes to a bunch of consulting gigs. And honestly, the very early stage beginning of Long Play before it was really an agency, I was doing consulting for like branding and content marketing. I was like writing scripts for videos and writing books and like all this stuff. And we really honed in on email marketing because I was like, one, it's a harder moat for freelancers. You know, you have to know strategy and copywriting design, implementation, all this type of stuff. And also it's a little bit more scalable like as a business model, whereas like branding is a little bit more challenging for example. So started building out that company and it was really just kind of like it started taking off. And at some point I was like, I can't do both of these, both of these like very extremely intensive positions anymore. And that was kind of when I left Best Self, but it was on great terms. And with long play, the 300 million, honestly, most of it comes from email revenue. Um, more recently in the last like, year or so we've expanded more to like sms direct mail other channels but we were really just doing email marketing for three years and i'm i'm a huge proponent of like double down on one thing get really really good at it rather than expanding to like a full service suite and to this day our strategy is always like we are going to double down on retention marketing like you will not i can guarantee you will never see us offering paid ads as a service that's just not what we're going to do um, i don't think everyone can do all of the stuff right and no one really do does retention marketing well so that's hey, kind can of you explain strategy. sorry to cut yeah. you off can you explain retention marketing a little bit better i personally like want to learn a little bit more about what that is specifically and i'm sure there's probably people listening to just what retention marketing really is yeah that's a great question so retention marketing really is just how do you actually retain your leads and customers after you've acquired them right so facebook ads instagram tiktok those are all fantastic channels and very necessary channels at generating brand awareness getting your customers on your site 
making their first purchase, you know, dropping in their email address or SMS. But how do you actually keep your customers for the long term? How do you cross sell them into different product categories? How do you get them to make repeat purchases? How do you get them to refer and talk about your brand online? How do you actually get them to start a subscription or reduce your subscription cancellations, win back your customers, all of that back end stuff. Um, we're finding now with Facebook ads being more challenging, Meta's just, it's a whole, a whole new world. iOS 15, TikTok might get, you know, canceled in the US. I don't know what, what, what the update is there, but acquisition is getting more challenging and it's also getting more expensive um, and more saturated. And now it's the brands who are able to retain their customers to actually increase the lifetime value of their customers, get more repeat purchases. Those are really the ones that are going to win in the long term and have a scalable, sustainable business. Because really, if we're looking back like five years ago, you could build a business just off of like one or two really good Facebook ads. Like if you could nail the Facebook ad thing, yeah. you could scale to an eight-figure business overnight. Now that's just not it anymore. Like everyone's talking about lifetime value. Everyone's talking about retention. So retention marketing is really just everything that tackles that part of the business and typically like email, SMS, direct mail are some of the big channels, but also things like tap cart or setting up a great referral program or setting up a good strategy around reducing subscription churn. Like how do you keep your subscription customers? How do you cross sell customers? How do you win back customers? All that type of stuff um, is kind of what we focus on. Awesome. Yeah. I think like for me, I built some companies during college that were all around discord and community and they went really well, but I just could never nail down like a solid marketing strategy. I was able to bring in a ton of customers, but it was always up and down and up and down. And honestly, for my other brands too, like before this one, I always struggled to find like a credible person who was going to help me with my social media or a credible company who was going to help me build out my marketing strategy. Has that been a little bit of an issue? Like do some people, some kind of sharky people who claim they do marketing or claim they can get you followers make it a little bit tougher in this industry because that's just me personally i just remember having to go through like so many different people who claim they could do this or claim they could do that and is that a challenge in your business or has that been a challenge just out of curiosity yeah honestly i mean we lose clients every once in a while where we because we do like an hour and a half to two hour long audit and strategy or app development for free before we bring okay, i never got that <laughs> we are like we are like committed to long-term partnerships like we we want to keep clients for years and we have a lot of clients who stay out for like three over three years you know so that's that's kind of like how we work with clients but every once in a while like we go through this entire process clients love it and then they they're like well like do you have a guaranteed roi or like we have this other comp like agency that promises that they're gonna like 3x our revenue in the first 60 days and we're always the first ones to say like we don't promise that like that's just this is not how marketing works no one else can guarantee growth for your business except you like that is the ceo's job we yep. can master retention marketing we're gonna tell you exactly how we're gonna do it we will show you everything and also at the end of the day it's the ceo's job to decide like is this going to generate ROI is this the best expense for us like how is this going to work if, with the rest of our channels um so every once in a while we lose clients for that like that and but also a lot of the time they come back three to six months later where they're like well like they, they got started really quickly and it looked good for two weeks and then they kind of burnt out our list or like then they just like started running a bunch of flash sales and like then it, they kind of tanked and like now we're getting a bunch of customer complaints it's like honestly we're like that that's a trade-off like if you want these quick fix results you will have to deal with the consequences of that and if you want long-term sustainable success you will have to deal with trade-offs that it's going to be a longer onboarding process like it is going to be a slow burn because we're trying to do it right and we're trying to do it in a way that your business is going to exist and be able to be sold in five years, not that you're going to hit your, you know, 10 X revenue goal in the first three months. Um, and those are the decisions that like as a CEO or founder, like that's your decision to make. And we're the service provider to tell you what we can or can't do. Yeah, I can definitely confirm that nobody got on a one and a half hour, two hour call with me and mapped anything out. So <laughs> it was probably just me looking for the quick fix and not knowing enough at the time. But thankfully now I've educated myself a lot more. I've met a lot of amazing people in the space like yourself. So let, let's talk about from a customer's perspective, like that works with you, just in case we have anybody listening who might want to work with any of your brands what does it look like when you're onboarded what is the experience like what can you expect maybe a little highlight on that yeah for sure so i'd say if you're a d2c econ brand who needs any help with like email marketing retention marketing we have 
something for you. Long play is best for typically like brands at least 5 million annual revenue, but we have some exceptions. We've worked with brands up to 500 million in annual revenue as well on the long wow. play side. Backbone is a little bit better for like brands just kind of getting started with email marketing with a smaller team, smaller budget. And that's really what we built Backbone for. But for long play, if a brand comes on, they're interested, we always do a quick 30 minute discovery call. That's really just to kind of get a sense of where you're at, what you need. Some brands are like, I just need the basics of email marketing set up and then I want to be able to run it internally. Some brands are like, I need full service management. We've already worked with a small agency. We need to level up. That's typically where most brands come to us for. It's like they've already worked with a freelancer. They've worked with an agency. Now they're looking for like the next level. And that's really just gives a sense of like where they're at, what they're looking for, how we can help. And then we do an hour and a half to two hour long audit and strategy development where we dive into uh, their accounts, look at all the, the numbers, but also see where the opportunity is going to be, how we'd approach strategy for them, show them examples of like exactly what we would build out. Here's the game plan. And by the end of these calls, typically clients are like, wow, this thank, thank you. And I'm like, I think I always think it's a good sign. I'm like if people are thanking us after quote unquote sales calls, like that's how we want to yeah, trips. That's a good thing. Like, yeah. We're like, we're not selling you. We're just going to tell you what we do and how we do it for an hour and a half to two hours and then at the end we will tell you what the price would be for us to do it for you that's really how we've always approached our our like quote unquote sales it's like let's just approach it how we would want to as a partner and how i would want to receive it as a cmo and everything that we do is like our entire leadership team has in-house e-commerce experience so everything we do is built towards like how would we what would we have want to have seen when we were in your position and then from there we do a four-week onboarding process we become like complete brand experts on the brand copy tone voice strategy we build everything and all of our onboarding is built to be as hands-off as possible just show up on the calls we interrogate them with questions then we present back what we heard as well as the actual strategy and by the time onboarding is done it's just full steam ahead we can just focus on execution but every our our entire onboarding process and our sales process is built towards partnership first, providing value, making sure we're aligned and then being able to move quickly rather than most agencies or freelancers where it's like, wow, we can get get set up so quick. Like we'll start sending emails within the first week. And it's like, that's that becomes your trade off because you're going to have six months of back and forth that you feel like they're not aligned on your brand or you have to give all this feedback and something goes wrong because it wasn't done properly to begin with. Um, and that's why we, I think that's why I named my agency long play. It was like, Hey, we're here, play the long game. We're going to do yeah. things right. We're not going to do things fast. We're moving fast, but that's not, that's not what we're optimizing for. We're, we're optimizing to do things right and what should a brand expect to pay monthly for like what should they have budgeted for their marketing spend and then typically how long do you think it takes to see results because i know some people are like oh my god i didn't make any money back in my first month like this is not working which come on let's be real <laughs> things take a little bit of time but what's like a fair estimate for somebody who's like going in maybe doubling down on marketing for the first time like what does that look like because i know just from a lot of friends who have built brands it's like i'm scared to spend money on marketing like i don't know how I'm going to see the return. I don't know how long I'm going to have to wait to see the return. So yeah. Um, so most of our clients are do come on for like a full service, hands off, like we're just managing uh, as a retention partner now. That starts at 6,600 a month and we start, I mean, we do a minimum six month contract. We do also have some starter packages for like brands who are like, I just need you to like set up all my basic flows for launch and then kind of, it's just a one-time project. So we do do packages like that that are a little bit cheaper and, and optimized for that. I and mean, typically from a result standpoint, like obviously the first four weeks is onboarding. So so we don't start sending emails out until uh, four weeks later. And then typically within like the first like two to three months after that, you should be starting to see some results. And we always say like with flows where we're building those things out, like you start seeing the hockey stick curve around that like three month mark. You're still, still start seeing revenue coming before that, but like the hockey stick starts compounding after that three month mark. And then for campaigns, obviously you'll start seeing revenue coming right away. But in that A-B testing in the strategy, like we start getting the data points to really scale your campaign revenue at, as well around like the one to two month mark in so we always say like think of this as like compounding where the first month you're starting like you put in your hundred dollars you're starting to see some some come in but the compounding doesn't hit until like three months in and that's also like the the lower risk because we're, we're confident that it'll continue compounding from there awesome what's it like being a ceo what was it like hiring at your team i know you have you 
I think you said you had like 30 people. You mentioned you have leadership people within your company. Like, what is it like in that role? What is it like managing all these people? Did you ever think that it was going to be a team this big when you launched? How How's that been? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, I definitely went through a period in with building long play where I was like, God, there's too many people. I hate all of this. Like this company is killing me. Like I this is literally taking years off my life. I hate all this. And like definitely went through that process of like, should I just shut this thing down? Like I don't even want to go through the process of selling it. So I, I just want to share that because I'm like, it's a very real experience. No matter how great the company is, I think it's a very real experience that a lot of entrepreneurs go through of like this burnout. Like I hate this thing that I've created. And what actually got me out of it was hiring Rachel, my COO, who is freaking amazing we run off of the eos like visionary integrator model so i'm actually quite out of the day-to-day of long play at this point it took a few years but at this point i spend you know five hours a week on long play a team of 30 it kind of runs itself and like most of the time i spend in that company is in sales and marketing which is amazing and it's funny i always say like long play has kind of become like my version of a nine to five not that it's like clocking and clocking out but it's like that is a safety net to allow us to do bigger things like we know we are profitable and keeps me out of the day to day that is like our baseline and that also has allowed us to fund backbone which is our software company where, which is where we spend most of our time but the eos visionary integrator model has been fantastic and I actually don't do a lot of our any of our hiring or anything like that these days unless it's for C-suite or like high level director uh, type positions. And with building long play, I was very much like I want like an in-house full-time team. Like everyone is like fully in this, no contract or like I didn't want to do like part-time type people who are like kind of in, kind of out doing side gigs or anything like that. So that was really the culture we created for long play. And I think it's perfect for an agency because like we really want to build a team that feels taken care of, that can take care of our clients. This is a people-based company. On the backbone side, I'm like, I kind of want to tinker around with like, what would a different culture look like? And what is the different approach to building this business look like? So for backbone, we're actually going a lot of vendors. So we have like our web agency, social media agency, development agency. And then I kind of want to just do that and then go straight to C-suite hiring and let the C-suite build out their own teams. And like for me personally to not have to deal with hiring junior or middle manager type people. And that's just going to be an experiment of like, let's just see what it looks like to build a business a different way in a different order. So we'll see how that goes. Awesome. And then you said something in there that I, I don't really know what it is. So I want to ask, I'm somebody who's always like, I don't really care if it sounds dumb. If I don't know, I got to know what it is. And you said, I think E, C2 visionary model. Oh, EOS, yeah. I, I did yeah. I do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in. I also think that is the greatest secret to like all of entrepreneur successes. Like just don't be oh. scared to ask like the quote unquote stupid yeah. <laughs> if there's never any stupid questions. So EOS, I think it stands for Entrepreneur Operating System. Um, but you can literally just Google <laughs> EOS. There's a book called Traction. And essentially the concept there is that the company has a visionary, which is typically like the founder and CEO. And they also have the integrator, which is typically like the CEO. Well, but they don't necessarily have to, have to be given that C-suite title. But the visionary is the one who's like typically like big ideas, um, a little bit more scattered. The job of, of a visionary is kind of like set the course, like get the lay of the land, figure out where we're steering towards. Whereas the integrator's job is to put all those ideas into action, actually have a game plan. They're the ones doing all of the management. So all of our C-suite for, for, for long play, all of our C-suite re- reports into Rachel, my COO. She runs the entire day to day of the company and she is my only direct report. And that was something I learned like deeper in where I was like, I hate management. I love leadership, <laughs> hate management. I'm not also not a great manager. I'm like, I'm like, I don't like following up with people. You know, I don't like handholding. I'm, I'm not the person to check in. That's just like not what I'm great at. And that also does a disservice to our team who deserves great managers. So I'm um, learning when to back off and realizing that like I, me being too much in the day to day actually causes more chaos than good was a big, uh, big learning experience that like made me happier and also made our team happier. Whereas I think a lot of entrepreneurs like myself included went to this phase of like, oh, it's my job to suffer. Like I'm supposed to be in there. Like they have to see me hustling. They have to see me grinding. Like they should see me everywhere. And it's actually not great. It makes things worse for everybody. And you're miserable as a founder as well. So this this has really been amazing, like absolute life changing from like a quality of life and also the success of our business as well. I think it's great that you were able to realize that because I totally agree, and I think every entrepreneur experiences is, experiences this at one point in their career. You feel like you need to do everything, but you might actually be doing your team and yourself a disservice by inserting yourself into a role that doesn't work for you. You're not going to be amazing at everything, and I hear that all the time. It's like my business was going pretty good, but there was a lot of hurdles. And then I hired the right person 
and we 30 x I hired the right person and the culture completely shifted. As a CEO founder, you're not going to be amazing at everything. And I actually think what will make you successful is being able to step back and identify what you're great at and what you're not, and then go in and hire the right people for it or insert the right type of coaching or team environment. That's where you start to see the results. And then so many people just get wrapped up in like, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to be in front and center. I need to run the show. And it's like, you really don't. <laughs> you hire amazing people. You work in the back end and empower those individuals to go out and crush it for you and do what they're really good at. You will start to see so much more success, so much more of a well-rounded company that you're running. So I think that's an amazing highlight. And I know we've just been going a million miles an hour here, diving really deep. We've talked about you or a math genius all the way through college. Then you got to go get a marketing assistant job, parlayed that into a CMO, C-suite level role, and then went from that to a CEO of two amazing companies and are just continuing to succeed with a team of over 30 people. Like what an amazing story. What an amazing time timeline of experience because you've really just been going up <laughs> from the first time you went and joined that marketing assistant to right now. So kudos to you for continuing to succeed, continuing to push yourself. And it has been an absolute pleasure to hear it. Towards the end of every episode, I always ask the same question to kind of take us back, slow down and ask something super simple that you can answer however you want. And that is Jess, what are you excited about in the near future? I love that. And also even before I answer that, I want to say it always sounds so impressive when you like say it at the like summary view of like wow look at these highlights like i'm freaking amazing and i just want to say to anyone who's like starting a business or in the middle of it where i'm like it doesn't feel that way it never feels that way when you're in the process the imposter syndrome is real like every day i wake up i'm like oh man like i need to be doing more like there isn't like, i feel like a failure like this this is all i've done and that's a very, the very real experience so just don't compare your your lived experience with like everyone else's highlight reels because the highlight reels don't feel like highlight reels when you're the person <laughs> living it but i think what i'm excited for really is just to continue like learning and growing i think that's one of the most exciting parts of like, starting a new business is like just being like fresh again of like entering the SaaS industry i'm like i don't know anything this is all so new to me like i know how to build a business but i know nothing about the software industry i'm, I'm wrong constantly and i really enjoy the process of learning i'm also doing a five and Mio DMT trip that later this week. So I'm really excited about that experience and just kind of continuing to create content. Um, creating the diary of an entrepreneur series on Twitter has been like, it's funny. Everyone's like, this is a great strategy. I'm like, honestly, I think I just kind of did it because it was like fun for myself. And it was like very therapeutic for me to like remember what I did all day because I would just blend black out and just like work. <laughs> I'm excited to hopefully like publish a book in the future around more of like the emotional and psychological experience of entrepreneurship, share more blog content and things like that. But really just kind of continue producing and creating. I love it. Where can people find you? I want anybody listening to be able to go connect with you, get in touch, read your content, anything that they want. Where's the best place for that? Yeah. Um, Twitter is probably the best place to see kind of what I'm up to. So that's Jess Chan with two J's um, on Twitter. Same thing on Instagram as well, which I which I post on. And then I also have my personal website, jesschan.ca, or uh, you can also visit Longplay um, and Backbone at longplaybrands.com com or go backbone.co amazing Jess, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. This conversation was great. I can't wait for this episode to come out and I can't wait to continue to stay connected and see what your journey has for you. Right back at you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. 